You know, last Sunday we, we studied something um, very significant. We studied about the apostolic prayer. How many of you remember the apostolic prayer? What did, what did the apostles pray? Why did the apostles pray? They prayed because prayer was their, their commitment, their life. They, all their life they were devoted to prayer. They were committed to a lifestyle of prayer. You remember this Acts chapter 2 and verse 42? What does the Bible say? All the believers, they devoted themselves to several things. And one of those things was prayer. They just committed themselves to a, 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 you know, a pattern of living that was praying. And you know, the apostles prayed. The key, the reason the first century church was so successful, was so powerful, was so... Uh, you know, impactful was because of the way they prayed, because of the things that they prayed about. You know, they did not just pray for superficial things. They did not just pray for just, you know, small, small things. They, they prayed for impossible things. They prayed for things that could turn heavens come down to earth, that could make the entire city go upside down. And, and because they prayed those prayers, God answered those prayers. Is there anybody in this place who has the guts to pray some, you know, phenomenal prayers this week? Is there anybody in this place who has the guts to pray prayers that will change not only your life, but your family, your city, your nation? Anybody in this place who has the guts to pray prayers that will change the destiny of our nation? You know, we just saw the election happen in our nation. Amen. And uh, the whole church prayed and, uh, you know, uh, from the north to the south, the east and the west, everybody prayed for a different outcome. This was not the outcome that the church necessarily prayed for. However, the church should understand, what we should understand is that once somebody is elected, once somebody is positioned by God, it is for us to honor them and pray for them and to bless them. Amen. Now that these guys are appointed, the Prime Minister and the Member of Parliaments, all of those that have been appointed there, they are not appointed there by man. Who appointed them there? According to Romans chapter 13, it's, it's God who puts them there. Now once God put them there, the Bible gives us a very clear mandate that we need to pray for them. We need to release God's voice over their lives. If God can use a faithful committed, pure Joseph to touch a Pharaoh. Is it possible in my nation? There was just one Joseph in the whole of Egypt. There was no big praying revival churches in Egypt. There was one Joseph. That was all that was required to touch a, a Pharaoh and turn him into the ways of God and, and let the ways of God be manifested in the nation of Egypt. All that was required was one Joseph for the entire nation of Israel to grow under the protection of the Pharaoh. Hmm. It didn't need for the Pharaoh to be a Christian. <laughs> How many of you know this? It just needed one committed Joseph. Are you willing to pray, Lord, make me that Joseph. Make me that Daniel. Make me that Mordecai. Make me that Esther. Make me that man who has access to the king like Nehemiah had access. Make me, that, make me that voice. Let my voice. You know, your voice can travel into places that you cannot travel into. Your voice can go into homes that you are not invited into. Your voice can go into parliaments that you don't have a security clearance for. How many of you know this? Your voice is more powerful than you think it is. Your voice is really powerful. And, and the first century church, they knew how important it was to pray. They devoted themselves to prayer. Now, one of the, one of the strongest, the greatest apostles in the New Testament church is Apostle Paul. We studied about him last week, right? There's one guy called Ananias who was praying and God gave him the directions to go and pray for Saul and Saul became Paul and Paul, you know, started serving Jesus. And Paul, after he, you know, became a, a child of God, after he became an apostle, 
he started writing letters to several people, you know, several churches. And in the, in the New Testament, they are called the Pauline ep- epistles, the Pauline letters, right? You know this? You know, from the book of Romans all the way till? Some say Hebrews also is written by Paul. Some say maybe, may not be. Doesn't matter. But all the way till Hebrews, it's written by Apostle Paul. Letters that are written to inspire and, and motivate and, and revive the church. In, in all of these epistles that Paul wrote, Paul expressed his prayers. Paul told us what are the things that he is praying for. Now today we're going to understand. Now there are a lot of encouragements about prayer. We're not going to necessarily go into all those verses, but we're going to examine all the prayers that Apostle Paul specifically prayed. Are you ready for this? Yes? See, if we can understand the prayers that Apostle Paul prayed, then we, and, and if we begin to pray the same kind of prayers that Apostle Paul prayed, then we will create the same impact that he created. Come on, church. Yeah? We will create the same prayer. See, he, he prayed for people to be saved. He prayed, and in one place he said, my greatest prayer is that the whole nation of Israel will be saved. He prayed for salvation. But more than praying for salvation of unbelievers, his primary prayer that is recorded there is for believers, is for the children of God, is is specifically for those who belong to the church. And so we're going to study all those prayers and we're going to pray for each other today. Those same prayers we're going to release over each other today. Is that okay? Are you ready? The book of uh, Romans chapter 1 and verse 9. It says, God knows how often I pray for you. God knows. He's testifying. He's saying, God knows. You guys don't see me. I'm very far away from you right now. But God knows how often I pray for you, my dear friends at Rome. He's saying, day and night, I bring you and your needs before God. You know, in other words, what Paul is saying is, You know, I pray for you constantly. I pray for you without ceasing. I prevail in prayer for you. Day and night, I pray for you. Amen. If you read through the epistles, if you go into the epistle of Ephesians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, in the first chapter, everywhere you would see the same statement repeating. I'm praying for you always. In the book of Philemon, in, in almost every, in the book of Philippians, you, you would find this statement that says, day and night I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you always. I'm praying for you constantly. I, I'm, I've, I've not stopped thanking God for you and I'm, I'm praying for you consistently. Paul was somebody who did not give up praying for the churches that he ministered to. He did not say, okay, this church doesn't make any sense to you know, uh, pray for these guys. I, I have to give up on these guys now. He continued to persist in prayer for these people. Amen. And this is what the Bible says. I, I bring you and your needs in prayer to God whom I serve with all my heart by spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, now you know, when we read that statement, what do we think? Probably Paul is praying for their... Uh, you know, financial breakthrough. Probably Paul is praying that everybody in their church will be millionaires and everybody in the church will be healed and everybody in the church will be, you know, blessed and favored and they will go from strength to strength. And But let me tell you what Paul was praying day and night. Verse 10. Let's read this. Okay? Let's read this. One of the things that I always pray for you is the opportunity, God willing, to come at last to see you. This is, see, what Paul is saying is this. This is your greatest need. <laughs> it's not money. It is not your healing. Your greatest need is for you to see me and for me to see you. Why is Paul saying that? Why is Paul saying that when I pray for you, I always remember this and I'm always praying for this opportunity for, y- for us to be able to meet together, for us to be able to speak for me to be able to speak into your life. Because but Paul knows this. Hey, hey, I know that I can pray for seven days for your financial prosperity. But if I can meet you one day 
and I can teach you about financial prosperity, then I don't need to pray for you. I can give you the keys that is required for you to be financially prosperous on your own. I don't need to pray for you. So what is Paul praying? Paul is praying, hey, this is the, the, the greatest need you have. I, I want to pray that we get to meet each other. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm being very honest. I don't pray that. I, I pray, say, I, I say, God, let whoever comes to church, let them come. I'm not bothered about who comes and who doesn't come. But this morning, as I was reading the scripture, I was convicted. I said, no, no, no. If Paul prayed day and night so that they get to meet him and he gets to meet them, then I need to pray regularly for you guys to come to church. Yeah, I'm telling you. And, and, and we need to pray for one another saying, hey, you know, this is a place where you need to receive uh, the grace for, for, to go into the next level. That is a great need in your life. You will be stagnant otherwise. Paul saw that and said, hey, you will be stagnant. Give me the next verse. It says, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10. Night and day. Come on, read it with me. Night and day. We pray for you. Asking God to let us see you again. Why should I see you again? So that I can fill the gaps in your faith. You know that, you know, how many of us know that we have gaps in our faith? We have faith, but you know, there are, there are those walls that are sometimes developing cracks, sometimes developing doubt, sometimes asking questions, sometimes being discouraged. You know, those gaps are formed from, as we go from Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday to Thursday to Friday to Saturday. And that is why Paul is saying, hey, night and day, this is, what, this is my one prayer that next Sunday morning you will show up in church. And next Sunday morning, I, I, I get to be there in church. See, see it was, for him, it was a different prayer because he had to go to this place, right? He was away from them. For, for us, we can pray that, hey, you should come to church, you know. It's, it's, not, uh, it's, it's not a lot of effort for me to come to church, but for all of us to come here. Amen? Amen. Night and day, they prayed saying, he, Paul says that I prayed and I said, hey, I want to come and see you. Why? So that all the gaps that are developed in your faith, that those gaps will be filled. Let me tell you something. There is definitely a special blessing for everybody. I was just worshiping this morning and this verse was not even you know remotely connected in my spirit at that time but immediately the Lord said there is a special blessing for those that are committed to coming to church on a on a regular bless regular basis every Sunday you keep coming no matter how hard it is no matter how much work you have no matter how challenging it is when you when you push yourself to keep coming back when you push yourself to be back in the presence of God, back in the, uh, under the voice that God is releasing over your life, coming back into, the, into that place where you're receiving refreshing uh, word so that you, those gaps in your life will be filled. That is a special blessing for you. There's a special protection over your life. What you don't know is that there is a wall that is being built around your life every time you walk into this place. You think that, oh, I'm just going there so that you know, just to make the worship team feel good or just to make the pastor feel good that, you know, the people in church. No, don't come here for anybody else. When you come here, your life is getting a, a wall. All the gaps in the wall is being, is being filled. Amen? Everything that is broken down is being, is, being, is being fixed, is being repaired at every time that you walk into the church. Amen. The Bible says, he, he tells the church, he says, uh, May God, our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, may He bring us to you very soon. These are, these are Apostle Paul's prayers. This is what he is praying day and night. He's saying, may God bring us to you very soon. Then he writes to the Corinthian church. He says this, he says, We pray to God that you will not do what is wrong by refusing our correction. I hope that we don't need to demonstrate our authority when we arrive. You know that Sunday mornings is also a place, a, a time for leaders to demonstrate their authority. You know that your leaders can speak things over your life and it can happen as it is, that they can speak that you are blessed and you can be blessed. 
they can speak that no i withhold this blessing in this season and that's that blessing can be withheld in that season do you know that you know that your leaders have the capacity have the power to bless and release you into your next level and so paul is saying hey when i when i come i don't want to demonstrate my authority in a negative way so i want you to do this i want you to obey the word the the voice that has been released over your life from from sunday when i speak something don't take it lightly you know go back and study it you know dwell on it let that word grow on you may you grow in that word so that when you come back you are coming back as an obedient person so that so that we, i don't have to demonstrate my authority over anybody when i arrive amen and then he says he says we are glad to see him weak if it helps to show that you are actually strong he's saying hey i don't want to demonstrate this authority just to show off that i'm i'm strong my hope is that everybody in this place will will grow up will will become mature he says we pray this is my prayer for you what is apostle paul praying for them not only that they will get to see him not only that he will get to see them and fill the gaps of their faith he's also praying that by the time that that happens that you will be mature 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 christians how many of us make this a regular prayer every day saying god make me a mature christian that's a good prayer to pray that's a solid prayer to pray this morning everything that i'm giving you is is meat <laughs> you know milk is for babies i'm i'm sure there are some many grown up babies in this place who still live on milk i i'm i'm just using biblical language okay i'm not condemning anybody who drink milk i'm just saying milk is for infants but adults eat meat and this morning paul is praying saying hey i want you guys to be mature that is a meaty prayer to pray when you pray and say god make me a mature man of god make me a mature woman of god make me a mature child of god that is a good prayer to pray my dear friends amen now mature doesn't mean that you are a a, a pastor mature doesn't mean that you preach mature doesn't mean that you know a lot of bible verses mature has a different understanding in paul's language do you want to understand what paul says about maturity let's study it says in first thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 12 what is he saying he's saying and may the lord make your love for one another and all people grow and overflow just as our love for you overflows now all of these scriptures you know may not look like prayers but if you go back and read the context i have removed that you know extra verses so you can go back and read the context it's paul praying for the church at that particular time and i i've just taken the subject of those prayers and i've put it in these scriptures is that okay so go back and study all of these are prayers that paul is praying for the church and this is what he what he's saying he's saying this is what maturity is maturity is when you grow in your love for one another and, and and this is my prayer that you will grow in your love for one another and all people will grow and overflow just as our love for you overflows that is a sign of christian maturity the sign of christian maturity is not that you know that you give a lot of money or that you you know do a lot of ministry the sign of christian maturity is your ability to love is your ability to love you know people that are not like you is your growth in love i'm not saying that you will be perfect but my question is have you grown in love from yesterday to today then yes you are becoming mature then yes you are a mature christian i'm i'm asking you are you planning on growing in love from today to tomorrow to 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 the next week or are you growing in hurt and bitterness and and vengeance and and all that 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 bad attitude 
If you're growing in bitterness, then I, I'm sure you're not a mature Christian. A mature Christian, he grows and, and the Bible says he overflows in love. And that, that's what Paul is praying for the church. And he's saying, may you overflow in love for one another. And he says, are you ready for this verse? He says, may, may he as a result, everybody say as a result. This he over there is God, okay? I know it's, it's small he, but it's, it's referring to God. He's saying, may he, as a result, make your heart strong, blameless, and holy as you stand before God our Father when our Lord Jesus comes again with us. Holy people. He's praying for the church and he's saying, as you overflow in love for one another and, and, the, and, and for all people, as you overflow in love, this is what will happen to your heart. It says your heart will become strong as a result of you overflowing in love. Your heart will become strong. Your heart will become blameless. And your heart will become holy. What do you need to pray for? You need to pray saying, God, one, let me be in the house of God where I'm getting taught regularly and all the gaps in my faith is being filled. Amen. And as a result of that, let me also grow mature. Let me not be a disobedient church attender. Let me be somebody who is continually growing. Let me become mature. And what is a sign of maturity? Let me overflow in love. And when I overflow in love, what will happen as a result of that? My heart will become strong blameless and holy good enough to be able to stand before God our father blameless standing blameless before God see you know we think that if only I will I've, I'm able to you know stop smoking or if I'm, if I'm able to stop drinking alcohol if only I can just you know stop uh, you know, going to those places or being with those friends, I think I will be holy enough. Let me tell you when you will be holy enough. When you are committing your life to a lifestyle of love, loving God and loving the people around you, automatically the Bible says, as a result of overflowing in love, God will make your heart strong, blameless and holy. And Apostle Paul is praying that for the church and he's saying may he as a result make your hearts strong blameless and holy philippians chapter 1 verse 9 onwards he's saying i pray that your love will overflow more and more somebody say more and more, more, and more. come on loudly more and more. more and more this is what jesus wants us to pray for each other for ourselves uh, that that our love will overflow more and more and that you will keep on growing in in knowledge and understanding see paul now goes a little more deeper and he's saying hey when you grow in love you will grow in knowledge and understanding you can grow in knowledge without love how many of us know that we can preach sermons without loving the people that we are preaching to? How many of us know that, we, you know, like, like, like Jonah did to Nineveh, when he was preaching to them 40 days and Nineveh will be no more. He didn't love these guys. He wanted them to die. He, he really wanted the city to be destroyed. He didn't love them. But there is a love that leads to understanding and knowledge. And, and, and Paul is saying, hey, so that you will keep on growing in the knowledge and the understanding that comes as a result of you overflowing in love. That is my prayer for you. Go to the next verse. Says, for I want you to understand what really matters, not general knowledge about all the Bible verses from Genesis to Revelation. But I want you to understand that love is what really matters. And he says, so that you may live pure and blameless lives until the day that Christ returns. What is the key Paul is giving here? He's saying you need to overflow in love. When you overflow in love, what will happen as a result of it? You will grow in understanding and you will grow in knowledge. All of these are things that we can pray for. You know, instead of just saying, you know, 
you should understand that you cannot do this naturally. You don't have what it takes to overflow in love. Do you understand what I'm saying? You don't have what it takes to have this kind of love. You need to be connected to the wine. Jesus, God is love, right? What do we do? We, we are connected to the wine by praying those prayers and saying, Lord, I want to remain connected to you and I want to grow in love. I want my church to grow in love. I want my family to grow in love. And as a result of growing in love, I know that we will also grow in understanding and knowledge. And as a result of that, I know that, that my life will be pure and will be blameless until the day of Christ's return. And I, I, and I think that's a good prayer to pray. That when Jesus returns back, or when I'm called to go to heaven, let me be found blameless, pure, and holy. Let my heart be found strong. Let my hands be found clean. Let my lips be found talking clean stuff. Let me be holy and blameless when, I, when I'm called to stand before my Father, before my God. Amen. That's a good prayer to pray. And that's Apostle Paul's prayer for the church. He knows everything else is temporary. He knows that if I pray that the persecution will stop, tomorrow another king will come and persecute them. He knows that if I pray that money will come, tomorrow recession may come and they will lose their joy. But he knows that I can pray for something that is more better, that is more eternal. Now, I'm not saying you cannot pray for other things, but I'm teaching you the kind of prayers that Apostle Paul prayed. Not milk prayers, but meaty prayers. That's the kind of prayers that Apostle Paul prayed. What did he pray? He said, Lord, I want these guys to be in church every weekend. Why? Because their gaps need to be full. And, I, and, and what else did he pray? He said, you know, God, I, I want them to overflow in love. I want their hearts to become pure and holy as a result of them overflowing in love. And I want them to increase in knowledge and understanding. Give me the next verse. It says in verse 11, it says, may you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation. It's not enough that you pray for people to be saved. It's necessary that you pray. Lord, now that he is saved, let there be fruit of that salvation. What is the fruit of the salvation? The righteous character that is produced in your life by, by your church, your pastor, by, by your self-control, by your willpower. Yes? No. It says by Jesus. He is the one who is producing this righteous character inside you. You know, when you're trying to help somebody and you're trying to teach them to walk in the ways of God, don't try to, tell, don't try to give them tips and tricks to be holy. Teach them to go to Jesus because only Jesus can teach them. Only Jesus can create that righteous character in them. You cannot create righteous character in anybody. You cannot bring holiness inside anybody. Who can create? Who can bring righteous character inside you, inside me? It's Jesus, the only person. So what you could do is you can pray, Lord, let your presence create that righteous character in me. Let it create that righteous character in my church, in my family. Lord, all of my sermons, I'm telling you, it is so that you can come to Jesus who can create the righteous character? My sermons don't create the righteous character in you. Do, you. do you understand what I'm saying? It's the presence of Jesus in your life that makes you holy and pure. And Paul is praying for that. Uh, wherever he says, may you do this, may you go there, may you become this. He's, he's speaking words of uh, prayer upon the church. And uh, give me the next verse. He's saying 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 11. Ready? Come on, read it with me. One, two, three, go. So we keep on praying for you, asking our God to enable you. Everybody say, enable you. To live a life that is worthy of His call. How will that happen as a result of you overflowing in? Love. Okay, today it's all about love, by the way. You know, if you, if you read how much Paul spoke about love, if you read how much Paul prayed that we will be growing and flowing and rooted and, you know, flying and everything in love. 
Man, I, I think that that's the only prayer that we ought to pray. The, the prayer of saying, God, Lord, make me, make me grow in love. And, 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 and it, says, it says, this is my prayer for you. Asking our God to enable you to live a life that is worthy of His call. Every morning, you know, before you, or every night when you come back home. Ask this, ask this question to yourself. Today, did I live my life? in a way that was worthy of His call over my life. Did I, today, did I speak words in a way that was worthy of His call over my life? Today, did I spend my money? Today, did I do my conversations? Today, did I interact with people in a way that was worthy of His call over my life? It was not. If it was not, then you can pray this prayer and say, God, enable me to live my life in such a way that it is worthy of your call. In verse the next word it says, may he give you the power to accomplish all the good things your faith prompts you to do. Paul is praying for the church and he's saying now that you, you've, you've come to this place where you're able to live holy, pure life because of the love of Jesus. Now may you receive the power to, to do everything that, you, that your faith prompts you to do. What does your faith prompt you to do this morning? What does your faith prompt you to do? I, you know, you heard an announcement, you know, that we are raising funds for something. Now, your faith may prompt you to give a certain amount. You may not have that amount. You may not have that money. But you can ask the Lord, Lord, give me the power to accomplish all the good things that my faith has prompted me to do. I don't have the money. I, you know, I myself did this. You know, I went, opened the quip document and, and I wrote an amount that I didn't have. But I know that I will have. Why? Because the Bible says, may He give you the power. You know, unless you pray for that power, unless you pray, you know, so often what, what we do is, our faith prompts us to do something and we, we, we think, oh no, this is not my cup of tea. This is, not my, this is not something that I can do. And we just hand it off to the, the more anointed people in the church and the more prayerful people and the more wealthier people. And we, 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 we trade it off to other, you know, category of people. But, but God is looking for a generation of people in this church who will say, Lord, may I want to receive the power to, to do everything that my faith prompts me to do. Amen. Everything. He, Paul wrote this to Philemon in Philemon chapter 1 verse 7. I, I'm praying that you will put into action. Everybody scream, put into action. It's one thing to just pray, another thing to put it into action. And he says, I, I'm praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understood and experienced all the good things that we have in Christ. You know, Paul was asking Philemon to be kind and generous to Onesimus. Now, who was Onesimus? He was a slave who stole from Philemon. And, and come on, if somebody steals from you, what do you want to do to that guy? If somebody cheats you, what do you want to do to that guy? If somebody hurts you, what do you want to do to, do to that guy? And, and, and Paul is saying, hey, I want you to put into action. Why? Because of all the good things that you have received from God, I want you to be generous in your faith. You know, put your faith into action and be generous. I know that he stole so much money from you, but let it go. Forgive him, love him, honor him, you know, build him up now. You know, now he is not the same guy that he was before. Now you be generous to him. Amen. That's a good prayer to pray. God, make me generous with my faith, with the way that I forgive people, with the way that I give, with the way that I love. Let me be generous. Let my faith transcend and let it become generous faith. Amen. Where I'm able to take action, where I'm able to put into action everything that I have desired and prayed and hoped for. Amen. Are you ready to go into the, the meat of today's word? Oh, I love this. I love this. I love this scripture. Colossians chapter 1 onwards, okay? This is where we are going into the harder things that Paul is praying for. Are you ready? Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9. Read it with me. So we have not stopped praying. You remember? He would pray day and night, night and day. He would be constantly praying for these people. And he's saying, we ask God to give you a complete. Everybody say complete. complete. He's saying, we are praying that God will give you a complete 
knowledge of his will. Somebody say, I want to know your will. I, I, I just don't want knowledge about, you know, Bible verses. I want to know your will. Paul is praying this and he's saying, my prayer is that you will have the complete knowledge of his will for your life. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that a good prayer to pray? And he's saying, and to give you spiritual, not just wisdom, but spiritual wisdom and understanding. Lord, we need that today. We need that. We need spiritual wisdom and understanding, not worldly wisdom. You know, the wisdom of the world, you know, Sefe brought that amazing word last night. How many of you, how many of you want to just bless him for that? You were blessed last night? And, and I like what he said. You can't even compete with the foolishness of God. The wisest ideas that you bring is, is not even the foolishness of God. That's what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25. It says that the foolishness of God is wise in the ways of the world. So the, the wisdom of this world cannot even match up to the foolishness of God. So we don't want the wisdom of the world. We want spiritual wisdom. Yeah? Pastor, that church is doing this. Doesn't matter. Pastor, I have always, generationally, this is how we have handled, uh, you know, marriage in our family. Doesn't matter. We want God's wisdom. We don't want your traditions. We don't want to know what, you know, what is convenient and comfortable for you. We want to go for spiritual wisdom and understanding here. Amen. We want to pray, God, fill us with spiritual wisdom. Fill us with spiritual wisdom. Let our church be a church that is filled with wise people. One amen. Thank you, Lord, for that amen. amen. What do you guys want to be? What do you guys want to be? Come on, let me say that once again. Lord, make us all wise. Yes. Spiritually wise. Yes. People that understand spiritual principles. Not those that are blinded to spiritual principles. Those that understand spiritual principles. Make us those people. Make us those people. It goes on to say, then, everybody say, then. then. He's saying that when you have this complete knowledge of His will, and then you have spiritual wisdom, and then you have understanding, then the way that you will live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. Then, you will produce every kind of good fruit. We are always running after this every kind of good fruit. But can we change the prayers that we pray? Automatically, we will find the good fruit. Pray this prayer saying, God, fill me with the knowledge of your will. Give me spiritual wisdom and understanding. Make me different this church, this day. Make me, let my decisions reflect the wisdom of God in my life. Let my words reflect the understanding into the spiritual principles that I have. And so as a result, automatically I will bear fruit. Don't just run after the fruit. Deal with the root. Go down. We're going to go into the root. We'll, we'll talk about the root in a while. Verse 9, he says, all the while you will grow. See, what is this fruit? It says, as a result of this, what will happen? You will grow as you learn to know God better and better. Scream it out, better and better. Come on, loudly, once again, better and better. better. Earlier, we, we heard Paul praying, you may grow in love more and more. And now he's praying, I want you to know God better and better. When will that happen? As a result of you growing in the knowledge of his will and wisdom and understanding, that is when you will be able to learn to know God better and better. I mean, you want to pray good prayers, pray this. God, I want to know your will and I want to know you better and better. I just don't want to know your will and be disconnected with who you are as a person. I just don't want to know you and love you but be least bothered about your will for my life. I want to have a balance. I want to know you, love you. And at the same time, I want to know your will for my life. I want to know the complete knowledge of your will to be in me. Amen. Are you ready for this? This is, this is beautiful. Let me read this for you. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 16 onwards. Okay. 
If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to mark or write, just memorize these prayers, okay? This will, this will take you a very long way, okay? The Bible says, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly. You remember Paul's way of praying constantly, always? And he's saying, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, what is he asking? He's asking to give you... <coughs> To give you, come on, we heard this in Colossians as well, right? What is he praying to give you? Spiritual wisdom and insight. Insight. You know, you know what is insight? Insight is what you cannot see with the regular sight. Insight. Insight. You go inside the problem and you, you're able to discern why this is happening in my life and what is the reason behind it. You have an insight. And Paul is saying that, I, that you will be filled with spiritual wisdom and spiritual insights. Why? So that you might grow in the knowledge of God. You know, I know people who pray for spiritual wisdom and insight. But let me tell you why they pray. So they can have a thousand member church. So they, their name can be on television. So they can, you know, preach to nations and, you know, do this and that and make a lot of money and all those things well let me let me give you a different reason to pray for spiritual wisdom and insight so that you can grow in the knowledge of god i told you this morning i'm going to serve meat not milk milk is saying man you you have this god will use you in nations and you know all those but i'm giving you meat and he said i'm telling you if you will get these things right if you will grow in spiritual wisdom and insight then this is what will happen. You will grow in the knowledge of God. That you may grow in the knowledge of God. Verse 17, he says, And I pray that your hearts will be flooded. Everybody say flooded. flooded. Not tiny drops, but let it be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope that he has given to those he has called his holy people. His chosen people, his rich inheritance, what the kind of hope that he has given. I want you to be able to understand. Everybody say this after me. Let me understand, Lord. Let me understand your hope. Let me understand your ways. Let me understand your love. Give me grace. Open, open, flood, flood my heart with your light. No sermons can open this up for you. Your prayer can open this up for you. When you pray saying, Lord, let my heart be flooded with light so that I can understand. You know, we live in the most hopeless generation that, that, that's ever lived. You know, we, you, the, the number of people committing suicides today, compared to, I mean, uh, we back in the day, there was so much problem with money, so much problem with health and not so much medicines as today and yet people survived all of that but we live in a world where we we are we are so quick to give up the first problem in your marriage you give up on your marriage the first problem at your workplace you want to quit your job the first issue in your uh, in, in your church you want to leave the church the first uh, problem with somebody and, and you want to go fight and you know we, we live in a world where we don't rely on the confident hope that God has given us. We live in a hopeless generation. We need more than ever before for our hearts to be filled with the light so that we can see, we can have hope. We can have that confident hope that something better is waiting for me. The best is yet to come. What I see in my today is not the end of me. The best is yet to come in my tomorrow. I want our church to be a church whose eyes are open. You know, when somebody comes to me for counseling and they say, I want to give up, I, I feel like, you know, giving up. You know, what I understand about this person is that their eyes are not open. Because if your eyes are open and according to Ephesians 1.17, you will have this confident hope that, that is given to you in Christ Jesus. God said this, I have a future and a hope for you. A hope, a future that to, to, to prosper you, to bless you, not to destroy you, not to harm you, but a future to prosper you, to make you great, to make you a blessing. Why is it that the church is ignorant of this hope? See, 
there's the, tra- there's the trap of the enemy. He just wants to keep your eyes blinded. The eyes of your heart. You may be able to see what is in front of you, but your, your heart is closed. Your heart is shut. And this morning I'm releasing the light of God to flood your hearts. So there will be nobody in this place that will walk out of this place without hope. Whatever may be your situation, may you enjoy and experience the confident hope that he has given to those that he has called his holy people. How many of you know that he has called you his holy people, his rich inheritance? God is not saying, not just saying that I am your inheritance. God is saying you are my inheritance. Can you, can you imagine what, what God is saying is you are my treasure. You are my chosen people. You are my holy people. And to my holy people, I have given a confident hope. I pray that your eyes will be opened to see that. Amen. Verse 18. <laughs> Read with me. I also pray that you will understand. Sometime back we prayed for understanding of what? Understand the confident. What was this? Come on, read it with me. Understand the confident hope, right? And why, why is Paul praying that our eyes will be open so that we'll understand the confident hope? The next verse. Now he's saying, it's not just hope that I want you to understand. Now I also want you to understand the power that makes those hopes come alive. You understand, right? Sometimes people only have hope. Sometimes people have a lot of abilities but don't have any hope. Paul is saying, not only is God giving you hope, not only do I want you to understand the hope, uh, understand the confident hope that God is giving you, I also want you to understand the power. Ready? Read this verse with me. It says, I pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for those who, how many of you believe him? How many of you believe what he says about you? How many of you believe that you are who he says you are? You believe that? Then I'm telling you this morning that this morning there is an incredible greatness of power that is available for you. But you cannot use it till you, come on loudly, you cannot use it till you understand it. So what should you pray this morning? Lord, help me to understand it. See, your parents may have invested thousands and millions of rupees for you in stock market or FD and all those things. But unless you understand how to use it, that money is a waste for you. You can't do anything about it. Am I right? Unless you understand where to go, what to sign, what to ask, what is your account number, what is your signature that you need to put. Unless you understand that, it's a waste. So the, gra- the incredible greatness of God's power for you, I'll describe that for you next verse. It says that that is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realm. I want you to understand this great power, okay? I want you to understand how much power it takes to propel a rocket from the earth into the space. You know how much power it takes to propel a rocket from here to the space? That's crazy power. You burn billions of, you know, rupees just to propel that rocket into the atmosphere. That's how much power is required. Amen. Now, the Bible says this power, not only did it raise Jesus back from the dead, but he, it propelled him to bring him to, a, to be seated in the place of God's right hand. That is the power that now is in you. What is Paul praying? God, I just pray that they will understand it so they can also make use of it. Not only that they'll understand the confident hope that they have, I'm praying that they will understand the power, the incredible power. Somebody scream, incredible power. power. Say this after me. I have a confident hope. I have an incredible limit of greatness of power. Let me read the next verse. It says in chapter 3, okay? He's saying, when I think of all this, what do I do? Instead of going and preaching a sermon about it instead of telling everybody that hey there is so much things in store for you what do I do I fall to my knees and I pray to the father the creator of everything in heaven and on earth what is he praying I pray that from his 
glorious, unlimited resources. He will empower you with inner strength through His Spirit. He's saying, hey, when I think of all this, I can't stay quiet. I have to get on my knees and I have to pray this for you. What do I pray? I pray that from His glorious, unlimited riches and resources that He will empower you with inner strength, not outward beauty, not outward wealth, but inner strength through His Spirit. Amen? And then, are you ready for this? So that Christ will make His home in your hearts as you trust in Him. What will happen? Your roots, somebody say your roots, will grow down into God's love and then it will keep you. Do you remember we talked about for the fruit to develop, you have to have a right root. And, and Paul is saying, hey, this is my prayer for you that, you know, that when ever I think of whatever God has in store for you, I pray, let that glorious unlimited resources be released into your inner man, into your inner spirit by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And then he's praying, saying, when that happens, Christ will not just be a visitor in your life. He will make his home in your hearts and you will continue as you continue to trust him. And then what will happen? When that happens, your roots will grow deep down. Now you are anchored in the love of God for your life. You're not anchored in people's love for you. You're not anchored in your salary that you get from your office. You're not anchored in the promises that the guy made to marry you. You're not anchored in the protection that your family gives you. You're not anchored in anything that you can see around you. You're anchored in God's love. Can anything separate us from God's love? Come on church, talk to me this morning. Don't be silent on me. Can anything separate us from that kind of a love? And God is saying, that is what I want you to pray, that you will be rooted in God's love. Let me tell you, whatever problem you have on earth today, all you need is a better revelation of God's love for you and, and that problem can be sorted. All you need is another encounter. The next verse, he says, and may you understand, may you have the power to understand as all God's people should, what only we already understood about the confident hope about the power and now Paul is praying may you have the power to understand what how long how high how deep his love is you need power to understand you can't understand it in your normal 50 gram brain it's not possible for you to understand the how 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 the length and the width and the height and the depth of god's love for you and paul is praying that may you have the power to understand that this morning may you have the power to understand that it's okay if people hate you there's somebody out there who loves you more beyond wildest whenever people complain to me that hey I somebody doesn't like me my, my only solution is you need to know the love of God for your life you need to know how much God loves you when you know how much God loves you you will not complain about somebody else hating you am I right tell me the Bible says you need to understand how wide long deep God's love for us is you know if if I if I'm saying that no that that there is no limits to God's love for you. There is limits to people's love for you. Can people's love ever compare to God's love? No. Then why is it that we complain about lack of people's love? Why is it that we complain when people ignore us? Why is it that we complain when people don't understand us? Why is it that we complain when people don't, you know, receive us or celebrate us or welcome us? Why is it that we go crazy? It's because we don't pray this prayer. To, we don't ask God to give us the power to understand how high, how long, how deep, how wide His love really is. Why? What? You need to be rooted in this love. For you to be rooted in this love, you need to understand, you need the power to understand 
what this love is. And he says, not only that you understand this, but may you experience the love of Christ. Though it is too great to understand, because it's too wide, too high, too long, it's too, too deep, oh, you can't understand it completely. But what you could do is you can experience it. Amen. May, may this morning not get over before you have an encounter, an experience with the love of God for your life. May you not leave this place without having an experience of God's love. You forget everything else, don't forget this one point. This is what God wants you to do. God wants you to experience His great, powerful love for you. Ah, thank you, Jesus. And He says, if you do that, what will happen? You will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. If you can understand, if you can experience God's love for you, you know what the Bible calls you? Complete. You'll be made complete. Man, you, you don't need a man to complete you. You don't need a house to complete you. You don't need that six-figure salary to complete you. All you need is an encounter, is an experience with God's love. That is a good prayer to pray. That is what Paul prayed for us and that's what we will pray for one another this morning. Is that okay? Yes, come on church, talk to me, be awake. Now is the time to be alert. Now is the time to be energetic. Romans 15 verse 13. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy. As a result of love, you should understand, you know, the fruit of the Spirit is love. Because there is an overflowing love in your life, automatically what will happen? You will be filled with joy and there will be peace. And, and because you trust in Him, then you will also overflow in confident hope. You remember, it's not enough that you understand confident hope, but you need to overflow in that confident hope of what Jesus is doing for you. Amen? Verse 11, read it with me. We also pray that you will be strengthened with all His glorious power. Why? So that you will have all the endurance and the patience that you need you may you be filled with joy this is a year of great joy for you may you be filled with joy that is what paul is praying over your life today if paul was alive if paul was here in our church this morning preaching to us this is going to be his prayer if i invite him to do a guest preaching on prevailing prayer he will come and pray these prayers he will say may you be filled with joy May you have the glorious power not to just do signs and wonders. I mean, I'm, I mean I'm, I'm all for it. But Paul never prayed for that. You know, you should understand. Paul never prayed that he will have power to do signs and wonders. What did Paul pray for? Paul said, give them power so they can understand God's love. They can understand the confident hope. So they can have endurance and patience. In, in these seasons when, when things get difficult and may you be filled with joy. That's God's desire for us this year. In spite of everything that we go through that we will defeat the enemy by walking in joy. The enemy wants you to walk in sadness. The enemy wants you to walk in depression. The enemy wants you to live sad. But this morning, we're not going to give him the, the joy of seeing us without joy because we will be filled with joy. We will have the power, the endurance, the patience required to walk with God and to be filled with joy.